thank you everyone for tuning in. This is Sean Shaw with Vanguards of Democracy. Our guests today bring an infection love of Florida to the table, lifting our state up to be a source of pride for everyone. Mario Nunez, star and founder of the Tampa Natives show, will be in our studio later to share the history of the show and why history and a positive outlook are the key to seeing Tampa's beauty. But first, I'm joined by my good friend, Senator Janet Cruz, to delve into the latest legislation and discuss the bright or bumpy future of our state. That conversation starts right now, so don't go anywhere. All right, welcome to another episode of Vanguards of Democracy. Uh, you're here with your host, Sean Shaw, and I've got, you know, I say this sometimes and I don't mean it, but I mean it this time. You're here with one of my good friends and someone that I have a lot of respect for, not only personally, but politically, and that's uh, State Senator Janet Cruz uh, is here with me today. Janet, thank you for coming in. I, You know, you were the leader when I was in the House, and I tell everybody the story that, uh, like, you were, you were someone that was inspirational. Like, there's a lot not to like about politics. But when your leader is someone that uh, commands the kind of respect you did and that we all looked up to you, it makes it bearable. And it's probably no accident that when you left, I left. So um, <laughs> I just want to tell you, thank you for all you're doing. And you're now well, in the state welcome. Senate. Yeah, um, I am. Tell me how you got started in the politics. Everyone loves these stories of yeah. how people got into politics. Well, let me back up and just say that on the day that I was sworn in as minority house leader, um, I realized how by most accounts and by statistics, I probably shouldn't be there. But I told my story, and I'm not sure you didn't know my story. And um, I was a teen mom raised by a very by a mom who worked hard, but we didn't have it a damn thing. We didn't have a nickel to our name. Um, but she loved us, and she worked hard to take care of us. And then I was a teen uh, teen mom, and you know, overcame all those struggles. But you came up to me after I was sworn in and you said, I had no idea that you went through that. I thought you were just some frou-frou lady. Yeah, first of all, I did not, I did Yes, not you that, did. <laughs> and, then, and then you said something so significant. You said, I would run through a wall for you. I did you. say that. And I haven't forgotten that. I, did I truly that. haven't forgotten that. And I would run through a wall for you. No, too, I appreciate by it. And I, and I meant it. And I don't, I damn sure don't say that about a lot of people. No, but and it was I so, I was so touched by it all. But no, I, I started out like most of us, grassroots. I remember walking the streets of West Tampa with Lawton Childs and Buddy McKay. I myself was a single mom. And uh, I remember that they were looking for a single mom to, uh, to have Buddy McKay over and do a woman's And if the audience doesn't coffee. know who those names are, she just listed. <laughs> that was the last Democratic governor yes. of the state of Florida. It's been 20 years some ago. years ago. So, yeah. Um, so there was Buddy McKay in my backyard in this uh, little humble abode and all these women that were there for coffee. And I realized how exciting all of that was. I, I, I worked on Sandy Friedman's campaign. I was Bob Buckhorn's campaign manager for all the races except the last one. Um, worked on several judges' races, and really just was very content with putting people in office, especially liked working in front, you know, raising women and putting women up in office. Um, and then Mike Shanti was a soldier, and he was also a state representative. And President Obama tapped him to come work at um, at the Pentagon for a very special position, which left his position open. Um so it was a two-month election cycle, and if anybody's ever worked on elections, two months is a piece of cake compared to a year. And uh, I jumped in the race, and I won by 58 votes for District 58. I thought that was oh, kind nice. of a message. <laughs> and uh, what was different about that race was because he had vacated the seat on election night, the, the winner became the member right then. So the next morning, I was the member. Driving to Tallahassee? Uh, well, I was a week away from Tallahassee, okay. but I went to um, the West Tampa Sandwich Shop and I had a cup of coffee. And then I went to the office and I flipped open that laptop and there was that state seal. And I'm not an attorney, you know? Right. So I looked at that state seal and I said, what in the right. hell have you done, That's girl? That's kind of cool. <laughs> but it's been great. And I learned so much and I... Uh, I really do think that I'm good at what I do, and it surprises me because I have no law background, but I know how to fight. You know, I'm, I won't say I'm a street kid, but I'm a street kid, so I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to uh, 
I'm not afraid to get in it with anybody. You're very good at what you do. We all we all understand that. But you've been in it long enough now to see our politics change. And it wasn't ever great, but it certainly wasn't where it is now. Talk about that change in terms of being able to work with the other side. Uh, as leader, you certainly have to have a relationship with the, other, the leadership from the other side to get things done in a way that some of us don't. The rest of your caucus doesn't have to have a relationship with anybody on the other side. You have to because you're the leader. But how does it feel to work? And I'll say it, you don't have to work with a party that seems progressively more um, aggressive and right-leaning, just aggressively conservative in a way that they weren't maybe even 10 years ago. Well, in 2010, when I was elected, shortly after the Tea Party came in, and remember, they were this big ultra conservative movement that wanted to shake things up. And I thought they were bad. Um, but back then, you know, there were a group of us uh, members that were, we were not kids, you know, we were members in our forties and fifties and we would get together and go to dinner. You mean bipartisan? Yes, yeah. but they wouldn't be caught dead at dinner with any of us now. Mm -hmm. It's really very sad. We are so polarized. Um, there's so much tension and we are so angry at the way minorities are being treated, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's inflation, whether it's corporate, um, I call it, you know, like corporate gifts, uh, when we should be putting more money into affordable housing and helping people with down payments. Instead, we don't know what to do for a big corporation next. It's a commercial lease tax. And that probably was a long time coming, actually. I, I would defend that. But there are so many tax breaks that these corporations get, and it's at the um, off the backs of the working families. And it's not working poor, it's working families. You know, uh, I have a fit about those that are uninsured, Sean, like uh, I talk about this often, but I see three layers of health care coverage. The first layer are those that are on Medicaid. Mostly children qualify for Medicaid. It takes a lot to qualify for Medicaid. You have to really be below a poverty level. And then people like you and I who work for corporations that have good insurance, we're at that top layer. But it's that middle layer. It's people like my mom, the working pe the working men and women who work for a company and the company says, look, you know, you can have health insurance, but it'll be $350 a month just for you. Now, if you're making between $15 and $20 an hour, clearing $350 for health insurance is really impossible. not impossible. So what does that mom or dad do? They go on, they go bare. They don't have any insurance coverage or they get one of these policies that has a $2,500, $3,000 deductible on the marketplace. So the doctor says you need to go get an MRI. Well, if you have a $2,500 deductible and an MRI is $800, there's no way in heck that that person is going to go get that test. So, you know, it's uh it's a series of of unaffordable uninsured uh that infuriates me health care is not a privilege it shouldn't be a privilege to to have health care coverage or insurance it's a basic human right and you know i think in other places where they've drawn down the federal dollars that are available to expand this coverage people are much healthier. You know, six, 7,000 people a year die because we haven't expanded healthcare coverage and no one cares. It's like a squid game here. Well, we'd rather turn down money to spite our face. We, I mean, we've done well, it not, multiple not times. Not you and I. Not, yeah, not us, but, but the, the party know, in charge. Unfortunately, the party, the party in charge gets to make the decision. And how did we get here? You know, we know we could do a whole show on gerrymandering and how they have created this um you know, how they've created this majority for themselves where they can just essentially shove any kind of crummy legislation down our throats. They hold the House majority, they hold the Senate majority, and they hold the governor's mansion. Until we make some changes there, these people are going to just continue to shove bad legislation right at us. And I'm in awe of legislators and senators who go up there. We're up there about four months a year, but session is actually 60 days we get up there and we stand up and we fight and they sock us right in the face and we fall. We get up the next day and we say, is that all you got? Hit me again. And they hit us again and we fall down and we go at it. And, you know, we stand like 
warriors just taking it and taking it and trying to raise this level of awareness about how awful this is. But, you know, in this day and age, even the press is, is uh, you know, it, the, the, the means by which we receive our news is also Well, you different. receive your news from where you want to receive it from. That is correct. And so if you want to receive it from a certain station, they're going to say it a certain way. And yeah. it affects yeah. the facts, unfortunately. There used to be three stations many years ago, and now you just go if you're— if you're a Democrat like me, I go to CNN or Headline News. If you're a Republican like some people I know, you go to Fox. It is, you know, when, when you first get elected, I've thought about this since I've left and since it's gotten so much worse. When you first get elected, you're taught to, you're taught to treat all the other members with a certain level of respect. And it's almost fake respect, right? Because you, you, you say, you know, thank you, Representative so-and-so, and so and uh, I appreciate this good piece of legislation. You say everything so nice, and you you are so overly, um, you know the the relationships are are so important. But it'd be hard for me to conduct myself in that way now, given how um, race how much race baiting goes up there, given how my LGBTQ brothers and sisters are treated. It'd be hard for me to sit there and have that same level of respect and, uh, you know, adherence to those core things that we're taught when you first get there. I agree. It's hard. It's much worse. And, you know, the terminology that you're taught speaking about is, is, you know, that's the old house and the old Senate where we, um, you know, we didn't ambush each other. We would call and say, mm -hmm. a Senator, I'm going to ask you these questions in committee and, or I'm going to let you know that I'm going to let you have it on this bill um, and you try to carry on, uh, you know, like senators and like representatives, but not anymore. And so they're not doing it. And I'm not doing it. That's, but that's really important because I, I think that Democrats sometimes like to play by the set of nice rules that your opponent's not, and it makes you weak and unprepared in response. You got to fight fire with fire. And it's, it seems like maybe we're doing this tit for tat thing, but if Republicans act like this and Democrats are busy acting on a set of rules that applied eight years ago, we're going to lose, whether that's right. in Tallahassee or D.C. And I think we do that. But remember, you know, we have a governor that's leading by a very strange and, and mean example. He is running for president and doesn't really care much in the way about uh, the legislation that he passes for Floridians. Everything he does is a soundbite for national news or for getting out of a primary in Iowa or the Midwest. So he's really playing to uh, a Republican primary on a national level. And we, the Floridians, are the ones that are paying the price for this. This outrageous, ridiculous legislation where he has said, don't say gay. Or, you know, I think that uh, I think that the LGBTQ community did a good job in branding that as don't say gay. For once, we were on top of that and, and turned that around. But... The idea and the premise, or it's predicated on more villainization of teachers. You know, what they're trying to say is you may have a gay teacher here who is grooming or some kind of pedophilia, and that's just straight up nonsense. We don't, we don't talk about any sex education until the sixth grade. I mean, they create these issues um, because the whole idea is parents get to make decisions. So they, they create this ridiculous law that we turned around on them, but guess what? They have the majority and they still pass the bill. No, the critical race theory uh, thing was um, it, we finally saw the math books that were banned <laughs> as a result of the critical race theory prohibition. And the math books literally said, let's all work together or stuff like that. Yeah. That is what got them banned. It's the most, it's just like, Sometimes I, I'm, t I'm talking about this now and I really honestly have a pit in yeah. my stomach because it's one of those things where intuitively, you know, this is so wrong on so many levels. And I get so frustrated when I feel that we just have to yell about it, but watch it happen. Let it's me, very sad. What do you, what do we do? Well, How do we? Number one is that, um, Although the Republicans are are in in the majority in 
in the House, the Senate, and the governor's mansion. Um, the House and the Senate are because of gerrymandering, and they've kind of played around with uh, the district lines so that they can make a safe Republican seat or a safe Democratic seat. And then they make sure they give themselves more seats than us. But the registration of Democrats to Republicans in this state is right about here. You know, they they kind of go on about how they have a little bit of a lead. But honestly, it's right here because the trajectory of independence is flying sky high. So um, don't be fooled by thinking that a Democrat can't win. Andrew Gillum was 30,000 votes. I mean, so close. Well, I don't even know what, what was that percentage, Sean? Do you remember? Points. Less than 0.1, somewhere See, around there. See, less than a point is what he lost by. That is a dead heat, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, um, 30,000 votes out of a state of yeah, 20, I think, 25 I think, million people. I think Hillary won by a larger right. margin than that, right? <laughs> but my point here is don't be fooled. We are here, like level, even with the Republicans. How, how, how do we affect change? One of the easiest ways to affect change is to get our butts to the polls. Um, If we can get Democrats to get to the polls and at least take over the governor's mansion, he can he or she can veto these bad bills. I mean, right now we have no way to stop this bad legislation in the in the Senate. We're 16 out of 40. So we are four away from being even. But again, gerrymandering takes makes it take a lot of money for us to do that. Now, we're coming into a midterm and we know that. Whatever party is in the White House typically has a tougher time. So it's not enough that I say to everyone, go vote. What you have to do is make sure that your kids are voting. You have to make sure that your sisters are voting and your brothers are voting. And, you know, we, we say this every time, but this is more important than ever. If we could take over the governor's mansion and we get closer and closer, Alex Sink lost by 60,000 votes. Andrew by 30,000, the number keeps shrinking. So don't let them fool anyone by thinking that they're in charge. They just have more money than us. And um, because they've been in power for almost 30 years. Well, your story talks about that. The last elected Democratic governor in this state was Lawton Childs. And that's been a long, long, long time. 94, I think, is somewhere around there. Uh, And so we, yeah, we... Governor's mansion is so important. It's who goes on the court. Uh, there's no black people on the floor of Supreme Court right now. Just, <laughs> but who gets who? Who judges are? Who justices are? Who secretaries of state are? The governor just appointed a QAnon supporter to be Secretary of State in the state of Florida, not Alabama, not Mississippi, not South Carolina. The Secretary of State of Florida is a QAnon supporter. And you know what? We are not Mississippi. We're not. We are not Arkansas. Our, our, our registration is just like we, you said. we are not the Deep South. We are Florida. You know, we are sitting in the midst of a metropolitan city, and we have, um, you know, we have an explosive um, number of folks moving. I think that I heard the mayor say two hundred people a day are moving into Tampa. Two hundred. Um, they're coming from all over. We are not this deep South mentality, but this guy needs to get out of a a national primary. So he's running bills that appeal to folks that are afraid that minorities are going to take over the country. Our politics is all grievance these days. Like who are you mad at? Who's taking your stuff? Who is the reason that you're not doing as well as you think you should? Well, what scares me the most is that president Trump lowered the bar on behavior. You know, it's like we would never have expected a president to stand up and just holler out lies and, and make fun of disabled people and go after minorities the way we saw it. I mean, he gave people permission. Um, I was sitting in a, in a pancake house with some folks that were speaking Spanish and for a woman to tell them to speak English, it's America. That didn't happen before. They may have thought about it before, but they, they'd been given permission to, to spew their hate. And it was so painful that day. I felt like, where are we? It's the same with abortion rights. What are we like rolling back into the fifties and sixties? And a lot of things. Yeah. You know, the Buffalo massacre that just happened, uh, that individual, there's video of him marching in January 6th, his gun that he was live streaming and using on the target 
had the word uh, had N word written on the target, and then on the barrel of the gun, it had written "Here are your reparations." And the Republican leaders of this state have yet to say anything about what happened in Buffalo. That's what's going on in our politics these days. It's it's disgusting. Let's let's go now to okay. before our blood pressure gets too high. Okay, okay. Uh, it's probably too late, but th- people are always interested in this. How much money is it going to cost for you to run for re-election? Oh my gosh! Yeah, you know. <laughs> because people, when you say the number, people are going to be like, "What?" Uh, probably honestly, I hate to even talk about it because I'm so ashamed of what it costs. But it'll probably be. I'll have to raise five or six million and the party will come in with more. For a state Senate seat in Florida. I could win a congressional seat for less right. than this. Honestly. Right. What the media costs so much in, in the Tampa Bay market. They call it the I four corridor between Tampa and Orlando. Although I'm only concerned with Tampa, the prices are a giant media market. And um, you know, when I last time it was, I don't know, twelve thousand all in and they probably spent a lot more than me. Um, I thought about what I could have done with that money, all the programs that I'm dedicated to. And I think I just made media outlets very rich, you know, uh, to get why my message. Why do you message. have to raise that much? People are always like, well, why do you have to raise $5 million? Where does it go to? And you just said TV. There was a time in the last four weeks of television. Remember, I was in a very tough race. There was a woman in this seat that was a Republican and she uh, was the incumbent and, and popular among her party. So they, you know, were trying to save her. So they spent a lot of money, but there was a time, Sean, that we were spending a million dollars a week on TV. Who are you telling? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Why, why do you have to spend that money on TV? I'm asking these basic questions because I think we are used to this, but the the average person wants to know, why do you have to spend $5 million and what are you spending on? And why are you putting a million dollars on TV like that? Well, it's about name ID, and as soon as your opponent goes negative, the best way to counteract their negative, because all these campaigns are all negative. You know, they will talk about stuff that I went through as a single mom 20 years ago, rather than uh, than talk about my record of voting. They'll go, they get personal, and they get nasty, and they get mean. And if you're not there with a, a commercial beside them, counteracting all what's mean and the mean things that they're saying, then you start falling behind. It works. It negative works. works unless you go up to. I hate negative. It, I really do, but it, you have you to counteract win. it. Yeah. Gotta, and if negative didn't work, they wouldn't do it. And if TV didn't work, we wouldn't be all buying all this TV. You right. have to do it. Well, you know, our, our newspapers if, uh, are different right. these days. You know, people like my mom would get up in the morning, uh, an hour early to have her cup of coffee and read almost every line in the paper. Uh, I think that we still do that with the Florida Sentinel Bulletin right. and La Gazetta. That's all that's left. But, um, you know, our news is coming from television mostly. Well, and now it's not even broadcast. Now it's Instagram ads and YouTube ads. Like it's even different than it used to be. But I just wanted to put that out there that this is races are expensive and that's how the money goes. When you talk to people around the country, and you say that kind of number, they're like, what? Oh, I, I could run for lieutenant governor of Wisconsin or some other state it's for that true. amount of money. And it's, it's true. Florida is, other than California and maybe New York or something, this is the most expensive state to run for anything in. Who would have thunk? I you know, know, our quiet, happy. What's well, the I-4 in Miami and then Jacksonville Media Markets, who are three of the most expensive 10 in the country. Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. I think about my, uh, my grandparents and great-grandparents here in Ybor City. You know, my parents were born and raised here in Ebor, and my great great grandparents and great grandparents and grandparents—they were all cigar factory workers. You know, and uh, when I think about them working ten hours a day, I said, "Oh, they they made cigars." Well, it wasn't that. It don't get it twisted. It was factory work. You know, they sat ten hours a day rolling tobacco. Um, but when I think about that and how, you know, meager their salaries were and the world that I'm in now, I know they'd be very proud of me fighting for working families like them, but they could, they would never wrap their arms around uh, this kind of money. I remember one time I was at Nordstrom's, my daughter, Anna, 
Uh, we all love, and we're yes, going to get on the show too. Who's who's quite extravagant about things, <laughs> not like her mom at all. But I went to Nordstrom's. Honestly, I was in a rush. Was going to do some kind of photo right. something, and I bought a pair of pantyhose. I don't want to be too explicit here, but the woman said twelve dollars or fifteen dollars. Right. I looked at her, and said, "Don't you ever tell my mom I paid fifteen dollars <laughs> for a pair of pantyhose." And besides, who wants to wear pantyhose anymore anyway? Disgusting <laughs> in Florida. Well, uh, Janet, Senator Cruz, we love you. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. And we're all, we're all proud of you. You're one of the the people that uh, we would do a lot for. And, I, and it's not just me. Uh, you know, politics is full of people that don't like you, that yeah. <laughs> second guess everything you do, uh, and that wonder, that think they could do it better. And uh, you are one of the people that we all have, like you and Fentress and other people uh-huh. that are just like, you know, that they're awesome. And we're so glad that they're, and we do anything to keep them there. So I want to thank you for taking this time. We're going to give you the, the portrait here to oh, sign. So yay. you can go on the wall. I love it. I love and, it. And uh, we thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you next time. Welcome to another episode of Vanguards of Democracy. This is Sean Sean. I'm here with my buddy who's got his own podcast and show, and that's Mario Nunez. Mario, thank you for joining us. Uh, man, I want to I want to start with um, your um, your show, Tampa Natives, and tell me about it. Tell me how it got started, and tell me what you're what you're doing with it. The Tampa Native Show started <clears throat> 2009 as a Facebook page a place where people could come together in that virtual experience to talk about Tampa as it once was. Um, I had some public access television production experience on camera experience. So after I convinced the gentleman who started the page, Steve Canella, I got to mention shout out to Steve Canella. Um, after he made me a co-administrator of the Facebook page, we grew the numbers that year, which was uh, new year's Eve of 2009. We had a blowout, 1970s style New Year's Eve party at the Marriott on West Shore. And, uh, and then I conceived the idea, listen, if this works uh, as a Facebook page, I think it could work as a television show, simple format. You put a telephone on the table, you do it live on public access television so you can recruit those phone calls. You pick a topic each week and man, you just reminisce. And you know, as well as I do, Sean, in these times of woe and want, people like to reminisce. Yeah, well- about certain times. About yes, <laughs> I agree with you, and I and no, I know I, I know of where you're speaking. I know of where you're speaking. I want to. Um, you and I met uh, based on kind of our mutual affection to Pete Buttigieg at the time. He was, um, you know, he's the Secretary of Transportation now, but back then he was kind of a um, he was one of the presidential candidates on the Democratic side. He was, I think, we got on board pretty early, yes, we did. and then he soared. And at one time was, you know, he'd won Iowa. He'd one New Hampshire, uh, and, um, and was kind of had turned into the big deal that we knew he, he would. What drew you to Mayor Pete? Why did you like him? Why were you, I think we met maybe at Ellis when they did, is that where we met? That's exactly when, right. When they did the first Pete thing. With Eve Barbanell and company. Yeah. What, what drew you to Pete? Honestly, I think it was his intellect and his, uh, sincerity, his groundedness, Right from whence he came, right, South Bend, Indiana, his history, his story. And then once you started to delve into the fact that the cat spoke six languages, that he just, you know, had the Rhodes Scholar kind of a feel on him, um, I leaned in. And every word the man said seemed to touch me in some way, of, you know, like, okay, that resonated with me. The guy, for being so young, is this the second coming of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, you know, I thought and, it was and RFK more. Well, and, but, and, and, well, Kennedy, and he, yes, yes, yes. And I'm, uh, I'm old enough to, to remember what that was. And, uh, and so, you know, I said, wow, this he gave me hope. Well, the last part is what drew me was the optimism. And I, I, I would tell people all the time, I didn't think that I needed a candidate that gave me optimism, but I did when I heard, I, and I didn't know who he was. I was not familiar with him. And I heard him speak, I think on CNN or something. I was like, wow, I, that, I got goosebumps. Super and, impressive. And I think I reached out to his campaign and I, I, I was just like, I want to help. And that's how I got involved. Um, and, you know, in these times, um, I didn't think that, I thought that that was old fashioned and we had passed that and that we needed these warriors and we needed someone who was going to jump up on a, on, on a 
and saber back rattle, of the truck saber and rattle. be as nasty to them as Trump is does. That is not what I actually wanted. Right. What I wanted was what Pete was doing. It was kindness. And I didn't and know that's what I wanted until I saw him do it. That's what I thought was most impressive. And um, I think we're probably going to get a chance to support him again sometime, whether it's in the near future. Sooner or, rather than later, or, we uh, hope. Or, or more after that. But uh, I, w- I was just impressed, continue to be impressed. And um, it's uh, he, he is he embodies goodness and optimism in our politics in a time where it's really hard to get excited and feel good about politics. A hundred percent. Um, tell me about your history in Tampa, man. Like I, well, tell, tell so, me about yourself. So born and raised here, uh, 1958, the old St. Joseph's hospital mm-hmm. on seventh Avenue, right there in the downtown corridor. Um, the youngest of three children. My, my parents just celebrated their 74th wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. So that's a huge deal. Two things yeah. have to happen when you have uh, 12 great grandchildren. Number one, you got to start early. Yep. And then you got to live a long time, yeah. my brother. So, and my parents uh, great, uh, graciously have done both. And I know how lucky I am to still have yeah. them with me because a lot of my contemporaries, um, you know, they're missing one or both of their yeah. parents. So there's that. I went to um, uh, Jefferson High School, graduated uh, class of 76. A little bit of time, well, I, uh, my associate in arts from HCC uh, went a little bit at uh, USF. And then I started my professional career with American Airlines as a flight attendant. Always knew I wanted to travel. I always knew that there was something out there just beyond the block, the confines of Tampa, even though my heart, I, you know, I came back, I came home. I lived away for 15 years, but I brought my family back home because there's nothing like being here, at least where, you know, I'm concerned uh, with my family history. You asked about my family history. If you want to go all the way back, my great grandmother was born in Monroe County in, in Key West. Uh, the migratory route following the cigar leaf was from Havana to Key West to Tampa. Talk about that right there. So yep. we take it for granted. Talk about how Tampa became Tampa originally. Tampa and Havana have always had a con- uh, connection going back, you know, to turn before the turn of the century. Certainly Mr. Ebor came from Spain to Havana, ultimately through Key West to Tampa. Uh, you know, we, we don't understand because we're, we, this is a different era, a different time, but there were steamships that were going to and from all day, every day. Right. And there were, the Holy Trinity was, uh, was Tampa, Key West, and New Orleans because and Havana and New Orleans because New Orleans was the other city on the Gulf Coast that and so you can imagine the the, the migratory patterns that people experienced. Um, that's why our cities are so close it, culturally and they're really an amalgam if you think about it with the Spanish influence with the French influence it's all present. Um, my grandmother came here as a seven year old child with her parents right Cuban parents. And my grandmother was born in Ybor City in 1902, my father in 28, me in 58, and my oldest son in 83. So you can see there's a generational thing going on here. And it's really a part of the fabric of our lives. I love Tampa history. The stuff that happened here, Sean, happened nowhere else in the United States of America. We revere cities like Detroit, uh, the Motor City, right? Philadelphia for the history. But Tampa was doing all of that Back in the late 1800s, just nobody knew about it, brother, because nobody was here who wanted to be here. The heat, the humidity, the mosquitoes, the alligators, the rattlesnakes, the just the living existing here was uh, was a grind every day. But, you know, the hard scrabble people that came here from Sicily and from Cuba, uh, you know, they made it work. They made it happen. We had the free black slave. We had a, a Jewish community that was vibrant. I mean... Those mutual aid societies, you know, the Cuban club. I was just going to say Italian the Italian club. club. Yeah. This building that we're in houses some tremendous history. And, uh, and you know, one of the questions you uh, w- that was posed to me was, you know, were there opportunities missed uh, here? I think one of them might have been that we didn't hold that history uh, in highest regard. We could have turned this place here into something like a Williamsburg, Virginia, where you could have had a district in Ybor City where, you know, you turn back the clock, you're walking through living history. You know, you've got the blacksmith in, in Virginia. Here you could have had the cigar rollers and the lectors in real time. So anyway. we I mean, the first time I came to Ybor City, the very first time, uh, I was like, this is Bourbon Street. This is, right? Don't this, you get that this, feeling? Look, this is a mini Bourbon Street, and now you know why. Yeah. Because of, of that the migratory. Architecture, the archi- yeah, and the and architecture they brought with them from New Orleans. You know, that right. wrought iron and the brick. If you, it's, it's just typical of the time. And, and you mentioned it, but um, the, Tampa, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, because this, this is your area, not mine, but Tampa, it was cigars. 
Tampa was known as Cigar how, City. Yeah. Tampa was known as it was it was the tobacco leaf that put us on the map. You know, it's, it's fair to say that if in 1910, 1920, 1930 even, uh, if you smoked a cigar anywhere <clears throat> in the civilized world, honestly, um, it was probably hand rolled right here in Ybor City. Because thanks to Henry B. Plant, right, and the railroad that ended right here at Union Station, Mr. Ebor was able to get his leaf from the dock, roll it here, put it on those trains, send it to New York, which then got it on ships over to Europe. So think about that. They were rolling a million cigars a day at one point because you had over 250 cigar factories with hundreds of workers. They weren't all large. Some of them were small. But- that was the economic engine that put us on the map. And probably the smartest thing that the city of Tampa ever did was incorporate Ebor city because otherwise it might've been Ebor instead of the tail wagging the dog, yeah. Ebor city might've been the big head and Tampa might've been what Ebor city is to Tampa today. Does that make sense? No, it does. And uh, you know, you can go on some of these tours and go into these cigar factories and get some of the buildings still exist. They're incredible. We're in a building that uh, we were talking about. This has some historical significance. I, I want to say it was the first brewery cold, First cold how, did, how did Mr. Ebor make ice in yeah. 1890? I don't know how he yeah. did that. It was that. in this building. This of course is, it was. We've got a brewery sign somewhere here. We had, the, we had the spring here in Ebor City that fed this building and brought the water to, of course, brew the beer. I mean, you know, the reason that the building is as tall as it is is so that Mr. Ebor could stand atop the tall part of the tallest part of the tower and see the boats coming in the, at the docks. Literally see them because it's only two miles, less than two miles away. Dispatch the, the horses and the carts. I mean, and he did it all. He started it when he was 68 years old here. So I don't know how you do that at that time. But thank goodness for Mr. Ebor and thank goodness for Mr. Bradley Plant, Henry Bradley Plant, H.B. Plant, because they really, those two guys put us on the map. If I was visiting Tampa for three days. Only three? Only three. It, it better uh, be in March because in August well, it's it, a different it, experience. It, it does get hot. <laughs> and listen, Florida was all swampland until we invented air conditioning, and that's why we're such a big deal well, right now. Yeah. And Miami specifically, you can look at the history of Miami, and once we figured out how to that it wasn't 90 degrees for seven months, Miami exploded. But three days in Tampa, what would I do? What do you think the best things, most important things to do? I think because I'm a history guy. That's why I'm asking. I think one of the things you might want to do, you might want to, you could start there. Certainly you can go to JC Newman's cigar factory at Relos, which is where my grandparents worked. And most people that lived in that area worked. It was one of the big employers, certainly in Ybor city and uh, take a tour of that magnificent, magnificent. It is amazing. The money was well spent to bring that up to uh, where they have it today. Quite frankly, I, I know I'm getting in the way here, but that's the only cigar domestic cigar that I smoke are, are Newman's just because they're from Tampa. Listen, that, we, we share yeah. that too. You know, uh, the same thing with, with a lot of the Cuban bread and so on and so forth. But so that's one place you definitely want to, to get a sense of that history, right? And then another place you might want to go to is um, the Tampa Bay History Center. They do a nice job there. And, you know, you can also get your little flavor of flavor with the Columbia restaurant. So you can experience that without having to go to the, the restaurant itself. Uh, they do a nice job of explaining a little bit of the history. And then I think if you don't take a minute and walk the campus of the University of Tampa and stand around that unbelievable structure that once was called the Tampa Bay Hotel, which was built again by Mr. Plant himself, Henry Plant, uh, as a means to bring people well healed from the north to uh, get over their consumption when they were sick, bring them down here, um, and those minarets. Yes. I mean, those minarets, look, Sean, we, we, you have to ask me, one of the questions that you were going to ask me was a missed opportunity or there's something we could do in the future. Get, ask me that question when we come back to it. Cause minarets answer it now. All right, here we go. <laughs> so I am of the opinion that a great city, uh, a great city, if you consider yourself to be a great city deserves a great flag. I'm a member of NAVA, which is the North American Vexillological Association, which is the people who study flags. Really? Yeah, and it's a thing. Oh, wow. And it's a thing. And it's a thing. Yeah. Yeah, out of Salt Lake City, NAVA, North American Vexillological Society Association. So, so uh, Tampa uh, has a flag that was designed by a civil engineer in 1937. And, and believe me when I tell you this, it's just hideous. Okay. We have and, a, is it, is it the pirate deal? No, it's not the okay. pirate deal. That's, that's, that's uh visit Tampa Bay and that's with Santiago Corral okay. and all those guys. And really it's not even skull and crossbones, although it, it, it looks like skull and crossbones. It's a couple of keys. Right. It looked like, but anyway, I digress. Um, so I think that in this new unit in time with our city going through this, you know, sloughing off of some of the old and incorporating some of the new, 
which the old timers resist. Um, things change. We need a new flag because one thing we know for sure about a flag, you have a good one. You fly it everywhere. You think of the city of Chicago, you know, when, when firefighters and police officers fall in the line of duty, their caskets are draped with the city flag of Chicago. It is omnipresent. It's everywhere. And everybody knows about that flag. A fourth grader, and draw that flag from memory because it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. That's what we need here, a great flag. And I think a flag has to subscribe to five simple rules. I won't go into them now. It's just look it up on right. Nava's right. website. But that minaret has to be the center of our flag. Why? Because it's the oldest building in the city of Tampa. It's been here since 1885. The city of Tampa owns that building. It is Tampa, the University of Tampa, and it's so unique to us. Nowhere in America. That's yes, the most recognizable. Thank you, thing Sean. On the skyline. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Thank you. So anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, no, you, that's cool. I you didn't know? even. I always. Will you help me with that? I, listen. Will you I, help I me like with it. that? Because I need. I like listen, it. I need a big, strong uh, set of shoulders to help push this car. Well, you just cart. had uh, Senator Cruz there. I know. I know she can help you too. But I, know. I, I, I know. like that idea. I hadn't it's, even thought of it because the. the when you want to bring seven districts uh, within the city limits together, I'm thinking city council right. now. You, you need a flag to rally under, right? Each district has its unique qualities and unique things that go with it. But one good flag, think the American flag, think World War II, the American flag. The most iconic image in war is the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima, right? The first thing we did when we landed on the moon, brother, before we hit a golf ball, plant that flag. So the flag is important and we should all know that. I, I like that, man. I, one thing, I, and this isn't a question, I just want your comments on it. And you've kind of spoken about it a little bit. The diversity of Tampa is something that I think it took me a couple years of living here to realize what was going on. Um, Cause I moved here from Tallahassee and we have black people and white people in Tallahassee. Well, you move to Tampa and there, you realize that you've got, you know, a, uh, a thriving Italian population, a, a thriving Cuban population, a thriving black population, a thriving white. And it is the diversity of Tampa. That's so cool. Uh, and, all these historical things going on, whether it's, you know, Central Avenue and uh, all the African-American things going on there. And, and I'm looking at Senator Joyner's picture. Her father owned one of those thriving businesses on Central Avenue, whether it's Ebor, whether it's, you know, along the river and what it was and what it is. Seven now. Ohio Sulphur Springs. And like that's so that is something we take for granted. It is. And to your point, I think we do all need to do a better job of recognizing and preserving that, that diversity, because there's not many cities like that, uh, particularly in Florida. There's just not that many. Miami comes to mind, um, and then Tampa comes to mind. Well, Miami is, is governed and ruled by the, the ruling class yeah. down there. So that's what this is, this is what makes us, our city so charming. This is what makes yeah. us Tampa. And, and I think really to understand it, you almost have to be f of it. But but if you spend a little bit of time here, it gets up on you, man. Yeah. Because you realize that, you know, what, what happened here, again, thanks to Mr. Ebor and Mr. Plant, happened nowhere else in the United States of America. And the people in Cleveland, they have a great history, but it ain't ours. You know what I mean? And and, and a lot of that is Eastern European in influence. Ours was all about, you know, Spanish and Italian, the Romance languages, the food, the architecture, the art. You follow? So... It's what makes us so charming. And I think it's still what makes us charming because we're an accepting group of folks. Not to say we don't squabble because you're going to have squabbles. But I, and I also think that it's an oasis of blue. If I can be political for a minute and I love you. Well, blue. It's, it's I, my podcast. Here so we go, my brother. Here, here, here we go, my brother. So, so it's always been an oasis of blue yeah. uh, surrounded by a sea of red. I have always said that if Tampa wasn't, didn't have its progressive political leanings, it would be Lakeland closer to the water, brother. You know what I'm saying? So so you have to take that for what it's worth. And, and we have to claw and fight tooth and nail to make sure that it stays that way. Lest we want to become what? The right. rest of Florida? No. I, and, and then and then what and then what does Mr. Lapano do? Because all he does is espouse the virtues of TIA, Tampa International Airport, which is a magnificent airport and the port of entry. But you know, we have to fight for that. John, like we have to fight for our democracy. No, I agree. It's, I, I was honored. You sure you to just want to do 30 minutes? When I, you <laughs> I was honored to represent when I was in the house, Ybor city was in it. Uh, the African-American portion of Tampa was in it and Simona Heights was in it. And the diversity of just those uh, entities was just amazing. And I always thought I had the best district because of it ran the gamut 
of all that stuff and all that history and all those people in it. And also it has some pretty you, good you, food. You get, no, 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 well. you, you get, you and music, you get that, you, you get that sense. It's, mm-hmm. that's what holds us together to that. Let me also say that as Tampa continues to morph into something other, um, and we kind of, and the, and the elders leave us. And that's part of the inspiration for the Tampa native show, because I realized that I got to capture these stories, man, before these folks take them with them. And, and you know what they say, you know, as long as you keep speaking of the dead and the departed, you always keep their memory alive. Right. And the last person that mentions your name, that's, you know, that's when they forget about you. So we have to do all we can to keep telling these stories and even the infamous and notorious, because we have that in our history too, but lean into it. It's, it's what made you who you are. Do you think Chicago I walks, was just gonna say you Chicago think, leads you into You think it. Chicago walks away from Al, Alphonse Capone? Right. Come on, man. I mean, right. you know, they make movies about that stuff. So, right. So that's that's what we need to do. We just need to, and and if I consider myself to be anything, it's one of those vanguards. I love that vanguard. And it matches with the show. Atta boy. Here we go, Mario. Thank you, man. I'm I'm gonna give you this this to sign here to put you on the wall of fame. Thank you for coming to to join us, man. And this was I uh, I love this. And and Dale Swope, who is the the founding partner of the our law firm here, is gonna I'm gonna have you and him on here at the same time because this history. Uh, is you all would love uh, Dale, this Dale's, together. Dale has been uh, gracious. He's been a sponsor of my show. He's also, I bet he has. No, he hasn't. No, that does and, not surprise And he's been on the show, and it's been so long since he's been on the show right. that part of my coming in today was to make sure to express that to him, and I just told Dustin Good. that, you know, I got to have your dad back on the show, and is he still growing his hair long? He says, yeah, it's down to <laughs> yeah, his shoulders. I said, now. what's he doing? You know right. what? He's bring- Ben Franklin going on. No, he's bringing the 70s back all by himself. He's rocking <laughs> the 70s. Well, man, thank you for joining us. Sign, we'll put you on the, on the wall of fame. We appreciate you, man. Thank you. Vanguard's of Democracy is funded and produced by Vanguard Attorneys, a local personal injury law firm serving the Tampa Bay area, with ingenuity and an indomitable work ethic. Don't forget to follow Vanguards of Democracy on YouTube or download episodes on your favorite podcast streaming services like iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And lastly, we're excited to announce that we're launching our new landing page, www.vanguardsofdemocracy.com, where you'll be able to ask questions, recommend guests or topics, and stay up to date with news and announcements. It'll be great. If you know how to bookmark a website, this is the one that'll make it worth it. Thank you.